I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. In the spring semester 2018, been teaching biophysical chemistry, BCH 341 at ASU, and this video is to look over um, exam, midterm exam number three, which was a take-home exam given to students. And uh, to put some context of what this is mainly covering, the, the topic that, that, that this is primarily covering is in biological um, uh, kind of biochemistry. It's mainly covering introduction to kinetics uh, and electrochemistry. Chemistry, or what we would call most commonly, say, like redox chemistry, reduction oxidation uh, reactions in chemistry or chemistry of ions, et cetera. And then, you know, the thing about time. So we've, we've in the first couple of exams, covered mainly areas in biological thermodynamics, and now we're moving on and looking at time scales through kinetics and look, re looking at thermodynamics through its potentials through electrochemistry as well. Okay. And so, and this was basically meant to be, you know, similar to a homework set. Uh, so a take home exam where they have, um, you know, over a day uh, to, to be able to complete uh, this. Okay, so we won't go through the logistics except to say um, uh, um, there were, you know, they, they answer five questions that I put in a similar vein to what you would see on kind of online quizzes or multiple choice, et cetera, mainly just testing concepts, some very, some simpler calculations or simpler graphing, things you should be able to do in more of a, a limited time format and, and uh, if you've been following the material in, in basic kinetics and in electrochemistry. And then the last one's much more like homework problems where they're really meant to be multiple step. They could be solved in numerous different ways um, there's different paths you could find to the solution, really meant to test uh, problem solving and really getting a grasp of real world applications and kinetics and, and electrochemistry related to biochemistry or biological focus material. Um, and so what I'm, you know, uh, these are made available. Uh, so the solutions are made available at uh, BioPchem. education, and then there's a section for uh, BCH341, and under there there's uh, a table and under exams, and like I said, this is exam number three, and I've included the exam, a short set of solutions as well as a, a full set of solutions. So uh, what I mainly want to do in this video is cover more conceptually uh, uh, some of them than uh, exact working out which I provided on the solution set. And this is uh, what we're looking at as a PDF uh, version of what you can download directly from this website. So the first one you can see, the reactant concentration, it's a first order reaction. So I immediately know, you know, it's not gonna be that because first order reaction, its rate constant is in inverse seconds, right? Um, so it has to be one of these four. The rate constant's not negative, so that eliminates two. So I'm down to two uh, before I even start. And I can tell, in fact, you know, that the rate is going to be significant because it goes from 1.7 uh, molar uh, to 0.01 molar in, you know, just a time frame, um, you know, here of 50 seconds or so. So it's going to have a, a, you know, a fairly decent rate associated with it. Now you can just do this as, uh, it's going to be related to the, the slope um, of if you take the log of the concentration over um, uh, versus the time. So I can plot this and I've done that here and this is using uh, Google Sheets. Um, to plot it, but obviously this is simple enough since there's only two points that you could just use, you know, you could just convert uh, these to the ln and you could just use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to get the slope as well. And the slope is minus, um, you know, minus the rate constant. 
The next one is just conceptual. We, you know, metallic groups, so they're very commonly heme groups and stuff, et cetera. Uh, metallic groups are very common used in biological systems as, as uh, um, uh, you know, to, to catalyze reactions. Um, proteins are classically enzymes. RNA to less extent, but can be. It's not that DNA can never, um, is, is, is not ever known to act as an enzyme, but you would just say, in fact, they call them DNA uh, uh, enzymes to, uh, there are groups that can, but you would say it's, it's very rare uh, we think of uh, DNA as acting as a, a catalytic enzyme. Uh, so that's you know, the best answer in this case. Um, or if, you know, the other one that would be acceptable is in a sense none of the above. It's amazing the number of things that can act uh, enzymatically. Okay, this is looking, we've looked at several times in the semester about decarboxylation reactions in different forms. Um, so this one is, is being enzymatically um, uh, catalyzed. So, and we're uh, given a whole, so this is given as the table and so this is enzyme kinetics. We're going to use uh, Michaelis Minton enzyme kinetics. Uh, so uh, in that, we're going to look at the inverse of uh, the concentration, and we're going to look at the inverse of its uh, initial velocities as well, and we can plot those. Um, and you know where uh, it's you know it's Vmax. It's one over its Vmax is going to be related to where it it hits the x-axis and. And this is going to, its slope is going to uh, be related to the, um, uh, to the michaelis minton uh, constant, et cetera. So, but we can also, you know, just get a sense for this. Um, you know, it's asking what, these are its initial velocities. As you go higher in concentration, it gets to be a higher velocity. So again, like, you know, we can eliminate this one because, you know, it would fall right here. It, I mean, this is heading towards its maximum velocity, so it has to be, you know, over 0.1. Now, so, so we can eliminate one right off the bat, and you can see, like, you've gone up an order of magnitude in concentration and from here to here, so you could even kind of guess that, you know, where this is heading to uh, in this problem, even without having to work it directly where I fit this line, get this, and extrapolate to here. And I report both of them in case uh, you were asked for that as well. Looking at this one, it's looking at vitamin C. And we're given, you know, the potentials here. And so we can, you know, arrange these. This one, um, this potential, and, and then we can, uh, um, you know, oppose that one. And so we can... Uh, get the overall EMF of this. And, and this is kind of keeping in mind that when you, for example, multiply uh, one of these by two or something, that uh, we don't end up multiplying um, the potential by that because it's already accounted for in, um, uh, in the constant we use. So, uh, so we don't multiply it, but when you do change it, when you move the uh, equation from reactants to products, you do change the sign of this. And then we're going to uh, add these two together. Uh, then we're going to use that, and then it's two electrons, the Faraday constant, adding these two together, which is going to give the overall delta G for this. Uh, and so we're going to be able to calculate it. In this one, like, uh, we're looking at, again, a type of reaction. And we're going to be able to uh, look up, again, kind of the same thing, looking up basic electrochemistry, looking up their potentials, and being able to combine those uh, to give a combined potential for uh, a specific reaction, and then convert it to uh, um, delta G. Uh, so then once we have that in delta G uh, form, uh, we can tell, you know, uh, when we add, so, it, you know, the, the standard state's 84, and then we're going to add uh, this component onto it where it's five times, probably, and 100 times the concentration of this. So it's five here and 100 squared um, uh, for this because there's two. Um, and so that's going to add this additional component onto it. So after I knew this number right here, I knew it would... Uh, get bigger, so I know I could eliminate that one and that one. How much bigger? 
you know, depends on right here, and so we have to do the final calculation to get the, the result. Okay, uh, looking at a, a, another biochemical reaction, redox reaction. Uh, again, you know, we have tables, and these are at both biopchem.education as well as several places where you can look up um, the potentials, uh, write each of the half reactions to give the full reaction, which we're gonna add these together. Again, when you reverse one of these, you reverse the sign, but when you multiply, for example, from two electrons to four, we don't multiply here because it's already accounted for molar uh, amounts and it's, uh, it's accounted for the number of electrons in the uh, voltage. Then once we have those voltage, we can convert that to an energy um, using the number of electrons Faraday's constant in the EMF we get from this. And then from there, we can convert it to um, an equilibrium constant. And as soon as we know that it's a positive, um, or a, a large negative delta G, we know it's gonna be a positive uh, equilibrium constant. And because it's fairly largely negative, it's gonna be very largely uh, positive. And so that's gonna uh, kind of eliminate you know, a fair number of these and, and kind of get us down to just a couple even without doing the calculation uh, to figure out what the final one is. Okay, we're, uh, this was a homework problem where uh, now we're looking at it at, at slightly different rates for these parallel reactions of, of how uh, penicillin uh, is changing with three parallel reactions. Um, and the first thing it's asking for is the percent of each one of these products from these three parallel reactions. And again, I can just look at this right here. So, you know, you know a slow rate, a faster rate, and an even faster rate. So I'm gonna make, you know, mostly this, you know, well, these are about equal. So we'll call this like, you know, 40, you know, a little less than 40, 35, and, um, <coughs> you know, and then, you know, less, right? Like, like the, basically this is gonna have the most in kind of the 40 some percent range would be my guess. This is gonna be in the kind of high 40s, this will be in the low 40s, and this will be in the teens. Uh, just from the ratio of these, before I even calculate it, so I'm gonna take, you know, the amount of one of these, 0.07 times the sum of all three, uh, to give me the percent. So once I calculate it and then uh, the percent of two over all three and the percent of three. So <coughs> my initial, what I thought of, you know, as estimates, uh, these are the exact values I, I calculate out. Um, then after that, it, it tells me what the temperature dependence is of starting with this first one right here. So starting with it at a specific temperature of 22 and now redoing that, looking at, um, at the, how the rate changes at different temperatures and as expected, it's, it's getting a larger rate, meaning it'll have a positive activation barrier. Uh, so now it's asking me to use the Arrhenius equation to calculate the activation barrier and pre-exponential factor. You'll see if you just plot the temperature versus the rate constant, it's not linear. I don't expect it to be, it should go um, exponentially. Um, so I need to get this in a form, if I'm gonna fit this, uh, it's much easier to fit to a linear form. However, you could fit this to an exponential if you prefer, um, or put it in, uh, the. sometimes the easier thing to do is just to put it logarithmically. So logarithmically one over temperature, inverse temperature versus the logarithm. Now it's a line and I can fit that line to this equation. I've also just blown up this component here uh, to show you what that fit looks like. And <coughs> I've also used a linear fit function in Google. And you see that the, the, the uh, equation is just a little different. In other words, the linear regression it used gave a little different uh, value. So, so this will vary a, a little bit depending on what you use as far as your linear regression algorithm. But you'll get in this kind of ballpark for the activation energy and uh, a pre-exponential uh, constant. And you can see uh, the pre-exponential is where it hits right here. Uh, and the activation energy is related to the slope over, uh, over R, so. Okay, so we know uh, the half-life is 22,000 seconds, and we're asking for not when half of it's decomposed, but only 
uh, you know, 25% is decomposed, there's 75% left of the initial value. So if it takes 22,000 seconds for half of it, and we're only looking for about a quarter of it, you know, this is going to be on the order of, you know, 11, um, you know, you know, on the order of 11,000, not exactly because this is not happening linearly, but that just gives me an estimate. I expect it to be, you know, somewhere on the order of 11,000 seconds ish, you know, plus or minus a few thousand. So that just helps me when I'm going to actually work the problem. So I know again that what the half-life is, um, so that uh, um, uh, I can get a rate constant, and now I can look at it when there's 75% of the initial amount with respect to that first-order rate constant, and solve, and I get a an answer of 9,130, so, which is kind of what I was in the right ballpark. Again, like the point here is that it's often very helpful to just read the problem and have an intuitive guess or a, kind of an approximation of what you expect the answer is so that if you miss a sign or do something like miss a variable or just calculate something wrong and it gets way off, you'll, you'll say, oh, let me go back and just make sure I didn't. The number one thing, you know, often people, myself included, miss when I try to work a problem is, is a sign or just one little input parameter wrong, which can change things drastically. And I think it's very important that we just have an intuition going in so that when uh, our intuition is not met, we can either A, try to conceptually understand the problem better, or B, go back and look and make sure we haven't made a silly mistake. Okay, we looked at a parallel reaction. Now we're looking at a sequential one. Uh, so you must react A to form this intermediate first to then form products. And you'll see that this constant is, is eight times as fast as this one. <coughs> um, so if this one is 0.4 uh, inverse seconds, uh, Ka is, then this one's eight times smaller, so it's 0.05. Um, and so I, in a sense, I can already kind of estimate, again, if I was looking at, at what these concentrations are as a function of time, um, it's going to start, if we start with this being all here, you know, this is a first order rate constant, it's in inverse seconds, so it's going to decay like that, you know. Because this, because this builds up slowly, eight times slower, it means you're going to build this up. So if it, if it was at the same rate, it might do something like that, and then the products come up. But this one's going to build up high, and then the, the products are going to come like that. So I'm already have an estimate. And this will build, if, if, if this was say now not eight times, but say a hundred times um, you know, slower, then it would build up even more, right? And even faster. So that's kind of where I'm expecting uh, this to look like. So I made again a Google sheet. And uh, so this is your intermediate, this is your initial A, and this is your products that are formed. And you can come in here and change these rates Based on these equations, it'll redo these ratios and replot this for you, and you can get a, t a thing in exact time in how many seconds, how fast A decays, how the products come up, and how these intermediates uh, change, etc. You can take a derivative to get this, or you can uh, just plot it based on uh, knowing the equations here, and you, you can also just kind of drop a line here or blow it up, and it's basically around six seconds is where you get a maximum in the amount of i. So if you made this, if it was only twice fast, the maximum in i would stretch out you know, much further, et cetera, which is what our homework, it was just two times, uh, ki was just two times um, that, and so it stretched out this way. And, and decreased here. Okay, this was another one based on homework uh, where we're looking at a specific uh, antisep uh, antiseptic and in fact it, one of the reasons it doesn't get used very much is because of its interactions with DNA um, and we're looking at its dimerization rate. Uh, it gives several rates and, and we're asked to calculate. So. Um, uh, this is another one where you can, you know, almost just by knowing what the two rates are, that the forward reaction is an order of magnitude faster than the uh, dimerization back <coughs> kinetics. It gives you immediate sense, you know, if you have a certain concentration of the monitor, you're going to have less of the uh, dimer. And so I, I have an expectation, and, and sure enough, I do, 
uh, have less of the dimer and I, and I, uh, I can calculate the exact um, rate, et cetera, for this. Uh, then I've given an equation that, that helps define how long it, uh, it takes to get to equilibrium in a sense a kinetic uh, component to this and, uh, and it gives an intuition field. So uh, you, you calculate out a value uh, for a rate and if you inverse that you get about 0.21 microseconds. Um, and generally, that's, that's good enough for the answer. Generally, full relaxation is considered five times uh, the rate constant, which is so, so full relaxation in about one microsecond. So, and, and basically, the answer is correct here if you just get somewhere between you know, 0.1 and 1 you know, microsecond. You know, it's, it's really about getting in the right order of magnitude ballpark for what the relaxation rate or the, how long it takes to get back to equilibrium for this system. Okay, this is one out of uh, uh, Jim Allen's book where uh, he gave a, a small a window of potential. I increased the window of potential and just asked for us to um, look for the midpoint, which often uh, there are tables of values that show the midpoint for a bunch of very common biological redox reactions, <coughs> which are very uh, common in biochemistry, uh, to help define which one it could be. Again, you can just look at this and tell like, you know, it's, it drops through 0.5 right here, somewhere between 600 and 700, more or less equally between these. So you're going to get a value of about 650 millivolts or 0.65. And if you look at the table in this book, you'll see that there's only kind of uh, one um, uh, suggested protein in that range. Um, so this is actually plotting it where you can see it falls here and you can see where it falls through 0.5 is, is right there. So, you know, 640, 650 um, millivolts. And if you look at the table, uh, that defines kind of a specific one in that table. Um, and then finally, uh, one that I would call is just a very introductory question, but, but so critical that we were able to, to look at, which is just you know, an overall um, ionic strength, you know, almost every biological solution we work with, it, it's almost critical to understand what its ionic strength is. And, and the ionic strength or, or the amount of ions in solution can often dictate how biological molecules, how they're activated, how they react, their kinetics, their thermodynamics, et cetera. So, you know, it's critical, even though it's a fairly basic calculation to be able to do. And this is one that is meant to hopefully be a little more real world in that looking at multiple different salts in a kind of an interstitial fluid. <coughs> this can be considered more complicated if you remove the assumption that all of these are, are co-soluble at these molarities, which you'll actually find you know, might not actually be a good assumption. But if we make the simple assumption that all of these will go into solutions as ions, meaning you know, magnesium chloride will completely dissociate into magnesium uh, two plus and, and chlorine minus ions, where there'll be twice as many chlorines, et cetera, uh, and we do that for all of them, um, then we can calculate. Now, again, you can just look at this and say, you know, the ionic strength for, you know, any pair, any, you know, salt like sodium chloride has to be at least the concentration of the of, of the combined salt itself, and, and it can often be more, especially when it's dissociating into multiple moles of things, or it has a lot of charge, right, or that's divalent, trivalent, least charged. So I can at least put a lower bound. There's 80, so tw another 20, so 100, 110, 170. Um, you know, it has to be above 170 millimolar, you know, uh, kind of by definition. So, and given that a fair number of these are doubly charged, you know, magnesium, you know, calcium, sulfate is two minus, you know, et cetera, that indicates, and, you know, some of them um, are gonna have multiple ions like chlorine, there'll be two for every one, magnesium, et cetera, means this is probably gonna go up, you know, a factor of two as well would be kind of my initial guess. And sure enough, when you do the calculation, that's your kind of, gut estimate is, is uh, bores out to be about true. Um, instead of writing this all out as just the sum over each one of the uh, cations, anions, and, 
et cetera, in this kind of long form, I think it's always useful to do it kind of step by step uh, for each one of the salts uh, in solution, just and then add them all together at the end, just because that way if you make a mistake too, it's, it's pretty obvious when you look at it uh, individually. So that gets us through uh, the problems we did for the take home exam three and kind of some estimates and, and working through some of the, the concepts and intuitions for the problems. I hope this video was helpful and you find these type of general problems come up a lot in, in all sorts of applications in biochemistry. So hopefully the concepts will ring through when you're working a lot of different problems in both basic kinetics and redox or electrochemistry and biological systems. Thank you.